good evening to uh, all of you let me welcome you to this uh, cma sri lanka covid 19 sme development committee seminar on update on current economic challenges and this uh, lecture will be delivered by dr chandana tamalsekara who is the director of economic research of the central bank of sri lanka I would like to uh, say a few words about uh, what this CMA Sri Lanka COVID-19 SME Development Committee is, and what stands for CMA. CMA stands for the Institute of Certified Management Accountants of Sri Lanka, a body incorporated by the Parliament Act Number Twenty Three of Two Thousand Nine, specially to promote. the cost and management accounting profession in this country and also to give an identity and status uh, for management accountants in sri lanka so is really a sri lankan body which will set up now we are in the 21st year and uh, now recognized internationally or we got the membership of what is called the international federation of accountants a global body for the accounting profession of which uh, i think almost all local and foreign bodies are members in different countries in about 134 countries so that's uh, something creditable as a, a sri lankan body to get a recognition from the uh, international federation of accountants and also a member of the south asian federation of accountants in the south asian region and of course the confederation and asian and pacific accountants the body in the asian and pacific region so uh, in our journey this is one of the things that we have done uh, while we are pr providing the uh, local uh, people with a very very uh, maybe uh, it should be uh, uh, affordable affordable qualification and especially today with the foreign exchange problems i think uh, we will be in a better position to provide education to the large number of uh, uh maybe students in this country who are unable to pay very large sums and also send valuable foreign exchange abroad so i think uh, this is something that everyone should look at because if professional education is promoted in this country you will be able to ensure that you will get people who not only have the academic qualification but also the practical experience which will make them employable and in demand both from the private and the public sector so that's uh, a very important thing so that's why we engaged on this uh, cma sri lanka covid 19 sme development committee which was started uh, after the uh, covid 19 pandemic arose and i think we have been meeting uh, since about april uh, last year and some of our stalwarts are here today there are maybe uh, uh, dr um, kulatunga rajapaksa the emeritus chairman of uh, chairman and managing director of the dsi group uh, we have mr suresh dimel who is currently the chairman of the export development board then we have mr atul edri singh uh, president of the uh, jica or the japan uh, they have very many activities with japan and mr hennai kabandar former uh, general manager uh, of the uh, state uh, bank Uh, where he was in in charge of the state uh, uh, investment bank so uh, we have a number of them and then of course as i said every monday we meet at 6:30 but today is a very special meeting because at our meetings there have been many things that have been taken up that is really how we can uh, help the sme sector and uh, we had a big conference in hambantota last year in september where the honorable prime minister Uh, was the chief guest and uh, in fact uh, he mentioned that the sme sector is the uh, 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 maybe the most important uh, sector and the spinal cord of the economy of this country where he said that maybe that uh, if you look at uh, uh, maybe uh, the sector economy it accounts for 52% of the gdp 45% of the total employment while making 75% of the total number of enterprises in the country so the importance is there but lot of them uh, only uh, maybe talk of it but we we our committee is really involved in assisting them and for which we have set up uh, special committees and one of the things that we have now taken forward is the credit guarantee institution now this was something that was started maybe in 2015 where even the 
uh, Asian Development Bank studied and allocated money, but uh, thereafter nothing happened. So our committee, we made representations to the Minister of Industries. He was able to take it up at the cabinet. And maybe uh, after long uh, discussions in April this year, it was approved. So you must be happy that today uh, the uh, uh, credit guarantee institution would come into operation early next year. And this is really to provide for, uh, guarantees uh, where people do not have collateral. So this is one of the main areas that we have been able to come in. Now the next area would be the export uh, sector where we are discussing with the chairman of the EDB uh, as to how uh, export houses could be set up to uh, help the SME sector. So these are two main areas. Then there are of course other areas on the labor matters and maybe the financial management. We've conducted a number of seminars. Last year after the budget, we conducted about six seminars, uh, both in English, Sinhala, and also in Jaffna, where we had it in English and Tamil. So where we uh, actually, the knowledge uh, process is really required. And we find that that is uh, paying uh, a lot of uh, uh, good to the SME sector. So today we thought that, uh, that we should also have a lesson of the economy. Because the last few meetings we have been having, I all really told Dr. Chandranath that we are having a uh, uh, lot of people who are uh, talking about the difficulties that they are imposing. But I think for that, the central bank has had many schemes and then they have uh, allowed uh, ba banks to uh, give money to them. But today the economy also has to be on a sound footing. So I think that is also something that all of you all should uh, know about the economy and how uh, the economy could be uh, reshaped with the support of the big and the small people. I'm also happy to welcome uh, Mr. Ringanathan, the managing director of the uh, uh, commercial bank. Now he's someone who's been supporting us at all the times and also in many of our seminars. And he's also here uh, to listen to our uh, speaker, Dr. Chandra Tamarasekhar. So just to uh, say a few words about uh, Dr. Chandranath. Dr. Chandranath is a macroeconomist by profession and heads the economic research wing of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka as its director of economic research. He also serves as a member of the Monetary Policy Committee and Market Operations Committee of the Central Bank, among others. Prior to joining Central Bank in January 2003, he worked as research officer at the International Monetary Fund Sri Lanka office uh, from 2001 to 2002. Then Dr. Amar Sekar graduated from the University uh, of Peradeniya, Sri Lanka in 2001 with a first class honors degree in economics. You know the place for the first class honors degree, of course, it's uh, the central bank. So I'm very happy that uh, he is now the holding a very, very important place in the central bank. He holds a, a, an MSc in economics with distinction and a PhD in economics on specializing in monetary policy and labor markets, both from the University of Manchester, UK. Dr. Amar Sayakara is one of the most cited monetary policy researchers in Sri Lanka. In fact, today's uh, daily news also I saw in the uh, uh, maybe the business news where there was a headlines of uh, what he has stated. He also ser uh, served as an examiner, visiting lecturer and a resource person at the Institute of Bankers of Sri Lanka, the Center for Banking Studies and various Sri Lankan universities. Dr. Amara Sekar is also an attorney at law. So I have uh, much pleasure because I, uh, I know that uh, he's always uh, uh, accepted the invitations uh, given because uh, only recently uh, we had a seminar with the CMA on the uh, uh, annual report and the uh, uh, economic situation in the country. But today we are giving an update on current economic challenge. So what we do is that he will be giving his address. Then of course we will have some expert comments from some of the panel members who are present with us. And then also you can send your uh, questions uh, through the Q&A or the chat, preferably the Q&A, because it will be very easy to follow it. So may I now uh, uh, invite uh, Dr. Chandra Tamarsekara to uh, uh, address uh, our uh, committee uh, members and the others who are attending this seminar. Thank you very much, Professor. And uh, it's great to be back, back at the CMA forum. And uh, if you can give me a second to share my slides. Uh, I hope uh, you can see my slides. Yeah, yeah. If you can uh, just yeah. voice a little, that will be good. Is that all right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so essentially, as uh, Professor Watavala said, uh, let me give you an update on current economic uh, developments and challenges 
I think uh, challenges are uh, accumulating at a very fast pace and uh, it is uh, high time uh, that the government, the central bank and the other policymakers do something about uh, these challenges to ensure that they are resolved uh, with a long-term view. So uh, with that, let, if I can uh, get to my uh, update, uh, starting from the real sector developments, the Sri Lankan economy grew by 4.3 percent on the first quarter 2021. Uh, I'm sure if, uh, most of you have seen those numbers. And uh, uh, the, if I may explain to you briefly what happened, what went on in 2020, uh, the, with uh, the change uh, in the government, uh, the, the, the presidential elections in the four, fourth quarter 2019, there was uh, renewed optimism. And uh, uh, the, if you look at the business confidence index and so on, you see a very uh, large increase in business confidence towards the end of 2019. But then came COVID, which affected uh, economic performance uh, in 2020. And uh, you can see the growth rates in 2020 uh, quarter, uh, on a quarterly basis. And uh, in the first quarter, there was a uh, small contraction uh, and uh, in the second quarter of 2020 the economy contracted by 16.4 percent by the second half of uh, 2020 the economy was ready to take off again uh, the the economy grew by 1.3 percent in the third quarter and then came the second wave of COVID which affected uh, the fourth quarter growth performance but still the economy managed to uh, record a growth of 1.3% uh, in the fourth quarter as well. And on the back of that, uh, in the first quarter 2021, there has been a growth of 4.3%, uh, which is impressive. And uh, uh, in 2021, we expect uh, overall growth to be uh, around or more than 5%, mostly because of the, the base effect uh, in 2020, but also because of the fiscal and monetary stimulus that we are seeing at the moment. In 2020, the economy contracted uh, by 3.6%, which was the second contraction that uh, the Sri Lankan economy uh, has ever seen. Uh, the first contraction was in, uh, was in uh, 2001, where the, the, the Sri Lankan economy contracted by 1.5%. So um, what makes us uh, confident about the uh, 5% uh, growth rate uh, for 2021. As I said, base effect is definitely one, but at the same time, the ongoing vaccination drive uh, is also a critical factor. We know that uh, at the moment there is a bit of uncertainty, but, uh, but uh, Sri Lankans are ready to work uh, from home if uh, it comes to that. Uh, and uh, the government has also realized the importance of letting the production activity continue. So the so even in the uh, even during the third wave of the pandemic, uh, the government allowed the export sectors and the production sectors, the industrial zones, to continue uh, performance so that the overall economic impact uh, would be less than uh, a complete uh, lockdown. So, um, the, you know the story about the vaccination drive. Uh, by now, uh, almost 100% of uh, above uh, 30 years uh, have been given one, at least one dose of uh, uh, the vaccine, and the second dose is being given uh, now. And uh, this is uh, an interesting chart which, is, which can be found on the uh, epidemiology uh, uh, unit website. This gives the uh, district-wise performance of uh, the vaccine, district-wise vaccination drive. And uh, in most districts, the first dose uh, uh, has reached uh, almost 100%. Uh, this has been updated yesterday. Uh, I'm sure there will be another update today. And overall in Sri Lanka, 96.4% have been uh, given the first dose. And the second dose, have been given to uh, more than 25% of the popul uh, uh, population above 30 years. 
so uh, as the government expects, we uh, uh, hope the, the vaccination drive will be uh, completed to a great extent uh, in the next uh, few weeks. And this slide is about the, what is called the Google mobility. Uh, you know, I mean, how uh, mobile phones uh, move uh, in the economy. And uh, you can uh, see the, the, the blue line is for Sri Lanka. Uh, it's compared with um, the, the Indian line, which is orange and the Bangladesh line, which is uh, purple. You can see the, uh, the impact on activity from the first wave and then the second wave, as well as the third wave. Uh, the economy was normalizing to a great extent in terms of mobility. I mean, uh, you cannot, I mean, just uh, like in the, like during the first wave, you, you cannot uh, compare economic growth with uh, mobility now, because as I said, people are so used to working from home and uh, working with uh, restricted uh, mobility. But, um, you can see the, the impact of uh, the, 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 the three waves that we have faced and uh, with uh, the increasing number of uh, uh, COVID cases found, uh, there is, as I said, there is a bit of uncertainty again. So if you look at most of the, the economic uh, indicators, you see that uh, there has been some improvement. Um, after the third wave, we have seen the ASPI stock market uh, performance improving and also purchasing managers uh, indices for manufacturing and services have been on an uh, increasing trend and we hope that these trends will will continue and uh, touching on very quickly uh, the performance in relation to inflation uh, sri lanka is known as a thing, uh, as a double digit uh, inflation economy if you look at the behavior of inflation from 1978 under the open economy, we have had very large inflation cycles, inflation reaching 32%, 28%, 25% and so on. But since January 2009, Sri Lanka has been able to maintain single digit inflation levels for the uh, long period of time, 150 months uh, by now. And we think uh, this is an achievement that we can be proud of. And uh, just imagine that, uh, so even now people feel that inflation is high. So uh, just imagine how high it could have been uh, when uh, inflation was recorded at uh, these 32%, uh, 28%, and 25% in the past. So people feel that inflation is high, uh, mainly due to two reasons. One is uh, high food inflation that we are experiencing at the moment. Uh, food inflation is right now in double digit uh, levels, more than uh, 10%. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you compare uh, Colombo CPI or the national CPI, food inflation is in double digit levels. And uh, when food inflation is high, people feel uh, inflation the most. At the same time, I think, uh, particularly in the informal sector, uh, the people's earnings have also declined, and that is also impacting their uh, purchasing power, which is also felt as a uh, high cost of uh, living. Um, so right now, uh, based on CCPI, year-on-year uh, -year inflation is at 5.7%. Uh, based on uh, the national CPI, year-on-year -year inflation is at 6.1%. Uh, Broadly, it's uh, in uh, the 4 to 6% uh, target range. And uh, we uh, expect that with appropriate policy uh, revisions, inflation can be maintained in uh, 4 to 6% uh, target range in the period ahead as well. So uh, let me take you through some of the uh, some of the measures that the central bank has taken in terms of monetary policy to support the economy. Uh, and uh, you, 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 I'm sure you have noticed that this from the beginning of uh, 2020, and actually uh, from the end of 2019, the central bank has been uh, uh, moving towards uh, an accommodative monetary policy stance. So reducing policy interest rates, 
reducing the statutory reserve ratio and the pumping liquidity to the market to support the, an ailing economy. And uh, in uh, 2019, the policy interest rates were reduced by 100 basis points. And in 2020, policy interest rates were reduced by a further 250 basis points. And the statutory reserve ratio was reduced by three, uh, 300 basis points, so three percentage points, uh, in addition to a reduction of one percentage point in 2019. So at the moment, we are seeing one of the most accommodative uh, monetary policy uh, stances in, uh, in the country. Uh, in other words, we are seeing uh, the lowest interest rates that we have, uh, that, that the country has uh, ever seen, I would say. Um, so uh, with the increase in liquidity conditions and also uh, the reduction in policy interest rates, we have been able to get the market interest rates down. So if I uh, give you some examples, uh, the prime lending rate, the prime lending rate was at 12.82% uh, in October, 2018. And uh, this was down to 10% uh, by the end of 2019. And uh, now this has come down to 5.72%. Uh, so from 12.82% uh, in, in October, 2018, uh, reaching 5.72% is a drastic reduction in the prime lending rate. And the average weighted lending rate, uh, uh, so if I ex explain to you the average weighted lending rate, uh, there is a stock of lending, stock of, stock of credit given uh, by the banking sector to the private sector. And uh, the, if, you give, if you take the average weighted rate of that stock of lending, that is called uh, the average weighted lending rate. And uh, for the first time in history, the, this average weighted lending rate has also declined to uh, single digit rates uh, this year. And at the moment, uh, it is at 9.5%. Um, at the end of 2019, it was at 13.59%. So on the entire stock of lending, you can actually do the calculation of this uh, um, more than four percentage point, uh, four, more than four percent reduction in uh, market lending rates, and uh, calculate the saving uh, to the private sector from this reduction in uh, market uh, lending rates. Uh, if you take the average weighted new lending, rate, so within a month, if you take the the new lending. Uh, by the banking sector, what was the rate applicable on that? Now it's at 7.47% compared to 12.8% uh, at the end of 2019. So that's one side, the lending, uh, lending side. But we know that uh, to bring down the lending rates, uh, of, uh, well, well, something that is essential uh, to happen is uh, low deposit interest rates. So obviously deposit interest rates have also declined. The average weighted deposit rate, just like the stock of uh, uh, lending that I discussed on the average weighted lending rate, the average weighted deposit rate is the, if you take the, the, the stock of deposits, fixed deposits, savings deposits, and all types of deposits, except, uh, uh, except uh, demand deposits, I mean, all interest bearing deposits, the average weighted, uh, rate on that is now at 4.77%. Uh, it was at 8.2% at the end of 2019. Average weighted fixed deposit rate is at 5.67%. If you uh, make a new deposit uh, this month, you would get 4.98% uh, on average, on average weighted basis. And if you make a new fixed deposit rate, you would get 5.1% uh, uh, on average at the moment. So the, the, the overall interest rates have come down. That is the message here. But we have also seen uh, movements in uh, some market interest rates. One is uh, the call money market rate, the interbank uh, money market, in the interbank money market with uh, the liquidity levels, market liquidity levels declining. We have seen an upward 
trend in the call uh, market uh, call uh, market rate AWC. Uh, it is still within this policy interest rate corridor of 4.5% to 5.5%, but uh, there has been an upward movement. In the government securities market also, there has been an upward movement, and that has been driven by the high borrowing requirement of the government. Uh, so uh, uh, on the one hand, the government uh, has uh, announced that they would like to get foreign uh, borrowing down. And uh, at the same time, they are relying more on domestic resources. So that is uh, actually uh, putting pressure on domestic resources at the moment, and that is driving up the, the years on uh, government securities. Um, so looking at the other market uh, interest rates, our intention was to get the interest rate down, overall interest rates down, so that private sector activity uh, would benefit uh, from that uh, lower interest rates. It is actually happening now. And since August 2020, we have seen a very healthy growth of private sector credit. And uh, this uh, growth of private sector credit is continuing. Um, and uh, by uh, June 2021, private sector credit growth was at 12.9% year on year. And uh, in the first six months, first half of 2021, we have seen the banks lending uh, banks lending to the private sector increasing by uh, 414 billion in the first half of 2021 and if you take the full year of 2020 uh, banks uh, credit to the private sector increased only by 374.1 billion so compared to that full year performance of increased private sector trade by 374.1 billion in 2020 in the first half of 2021 itself uh, the banks have lent more than uh, what was lent in 2020. And the second chart here shows the performance of uh, private sector credit in terms of uh, sectors, agriculture, fishing, uh, industry, services, and personal loans and advance. Usually what we generally see is that whenever interest rates uh, start declining, there is large demand from uh, uh, individuals and businesses in terms of personal loans and uh, advances, um, small businesses. But uh, then uh, after some time, uh, that gets broad based and uh, we would see uh, credit towards agriculture and fishing industry services uh, increasing gradually. And that's what we are seeing at the moment. So uh, right now, although there was a delay in credit towards those uh, what, what are called more productive sectors. Uh, now it is actually happening. So we hope that uh, going forward, this trend will continue. Uh, personal loans and advances, uh, the growth of that will uh, um, stabilize while credit towards agriculture and fishing industry and services sectors uh, will increase in the period ahead. And uh, on the one hand, private sector credit growth has been increasing. And on the other hand, credit to the government has also, uh, to, the, to the public sector has also increased. In 2020, uh, there was a huge increase in credit to the public sector. Uh, in, in the first half of 2021 also, uh, this has been substantial, but not as much uh, as in uh, 2020. With that, broad money growth has also expanded. And at the moment, broad money uh, or the entire money stock of the country is growing at 21.5%. Uh, because this uh, uh, CMS forum on uh, the SME sector, I thought I will uh, uh, share with you a slide on uh, interest rates on uh, uh, credit to uh, the SME sector from the banking system. And uh, last year, uh, we started uh, computing what is called the average weighted new SME loan rate and the average weighted SME loan rate. And we are pleased to uh, see those rates also declining uh, gradually. So at the moment, the average weighted SME loan rate is at 10.21%. Uh, 
compared to the average weighted lending rate of, as I said earlier, about 9.5%. And the average weighted new uh, SME loan rate, I mean, if you take, uh, uh, the, if uh, an SME uh, takes a loan uh, this month uh, from the banking system, on an average weighted basis, it would get uh, it would uh, have a rate of 8.45% compared to the average weighted new lending rate of 7.74%. So obviously, the SMEs are facing a higher interest rate than uh, the rest of the economy. Uh, but uh, but uh, we, as I said, we are pleased to uh, note that uh, there has, has been a decline in uh, those rates as well. And uh, banks uh, are required to have at least 20% growth of loans uh, granted to MSMEs by end of uh, 2021, compared to the outstanding uh, reported by end of 2020. That is also another measure to support the SME sector that is in place at the moment. Moving on to uh, the external sector, which is uh, probably uh, the most uh, crucial sector at the moment, um, uh, so uh, essentially, I mean, we have seen uh, exports uh, normalizing uh, during the month of uh, June. We saw exports uh, growing by more than one billion uh, US dollars in uh, the month of July. Also, according to the pre preliminary figures, we have uh, exports have been very close to. Uh, 1.1 billion US dollars, which is impressive. So we are back to uh, the, the performance that we saw in 2000, uh, 2019. Um, but on the other hand, we have also seen imports uh, increasing. And uh, there, there are several reasons. I will explain uh, a couple of reasons in the next uh, few slides, but uh, with this, the trade deficit, uh, which is the difference between exports and imports, merchandise exports and imports, um, has also expanded during the first half of 2021. So in, the, uh, in uh, 2020, in the first half, the trade deficit was 3.3 uh, billion US dollars. That has expanded to uh, 4.3 billion US dollars in, uh, in the first half of 2021. Um, and uh, as I said, uh, there are several reasons for this expanded trade deficit. One reason is obviously the higher fuel bill the country is uh, facing. So uh, if I take you through what is in the chart, in uh, 2020, uh, if you take the monthly averages, uh, in uh, 2020, uh, Sri Lanka spent uh, on, on uh, non-fuel imports, US dollars 1.1 billion uh, during uh, each month on, on uh, average. That has now increased to 1.4 billion, 1.37 billion. If you take the total imports, including fuel, uh, it has increased from 1.3 billion in 2020 to 1.7 billion by uh, in the first half of 2021. So the fuel bill has increased drastically compared to uh, 2020. Overall imports have, uh, uh, on a monthly average basis, uh, have in increased by about 330 million. And uh, non-fuel imports have also increased uh, by a substantial amount. So uh, on the one hand, we are seeing, uh, we are looking at uh, about uh, uh, around 1 billion uh, exports, merchandise exports. But on the other hand, non-fuel merchandise exports are at 1.4 billion. And with fuel, uh, the merchandise imports are at 1.7 billion. So we are actually looking at a large trade deficit, which has to be addressed uh, Immediately, I would say. Um, so talking uh, a bit more about uh, oil, uh, we, uh, there is a sigh of relief because, I mean, today we saw oil prices below $70 a barrel. But uh, if you take the, the month of July, the average oil, average Brent price was at 
dollars a barrel. In June, it was $73.11 uh, a barrel. In 2020, it was as low as $43.35 uh, a barrel. And uh, when you look at the global projections for oil, you can you you cannot predict uh, uh, global uh, uh, the you cannot predict the global oil prices. Those projections have always been wrong, but uh, but uh, the the global analysts are expecting uh, higher oil prices. Uh, Sixty eight seven point seven eight Energy Information Administration U.S. Uh, projection. And the IMF is projecting 64.68 uh, uh, as oil prices. And they are expecting lower oil prices for 2022. But as I said, oil prices are very difficult to be, uh, uh, to be uh, projected, just like the movements of other commodity prices, including gold. Um, so that's uh, the story about uh, imports and exports. Uh, we are happy about the export performance, but uh, the, we cannot be too happy about what is happening in relation to imports, fuel and uh, non-fuel. Uh, with regard to workers' remittances, we saw a continued increase in workers' remittances from uh, the middle of 2020, continued the on year increase, which continued until May 2021. Uh, in June, uh, this year-on-year -year growth has uh, actually uh, become a contraction. So uh, there has been a year-on-year -year contraction during the month of June 2021. Um, and uh, uh, essentially, uh, workers' remittances have declined by 16.4% during the month of June. But overall, if you take the first half of the year, workers' remittances have increased by 11.6% year-on-year, uh, giving us about 3.3 .3 billion US dollars. Uh, and usually it is towards the second half of sec uh, fourth quarter of uh, each year that we get the largest amount of workers' remittances. And we hope that this trend will continue uh, in 2021 as well. But uh, there is one key reason which is uh, keeping, uh, actually, I mean, there are two key reasons which is keep, uh, keeping uh, workers' remittances uh, recorded down. One is uh, that people have moved uh, back and forth. So uh, um, I, in, in the past, I mean, when there were uh, mobility restrictions, people used to remit money through the banking system. But now this is changing. That's one reason. At the same time, there is a uh, disparity between the official exchange rate and uh, the exchange rate out there in the gray market. That is, uh, that could also be one reason for this decline in uh, remittances officially recorded. With regard to tourist arrivals, uh, we uh, were expecting a rebound in tourism uh, in 2021, but now it looks like it will get uh, delayed further and further. But we are still hopeful with the vaccination drive particularly targeting the tourism uh, sector and uh, and the government has been uh, they have been uh, promoting uh, vaccines in the tourism sector for uh, those who are under the age 30 as well uh, so when the peak tourist season in sri lanka starts towards the end of the year we hope that there will be a recovery in global tourism and from there on there will be a uh, uh, tourism sector will bounce back to its, uh, uh, you know, I mean, the, the 5 billion earning potential that we used to have before the Easter Sunday attacks. Uh, so um, with regard to the exchange rate, the Sri Lanka rupee has depreciated by 6.7% uh, thus far during the year. If you uh, compare that depreciation with uh, the other currencies, we have seen uh, um, the, the Indonesian rupiah depreciating by 2.3%, uh, Indian rupee by 1.4%, Thai baht by 10.6%, peso by 4.6%, uh, Philippine peso, and so on. Uh, so um, the, the exchange rate uh, officially seems to be stable now. And uh, the, so this is done through uh, 
uh, on the one hand through moral suasion and also uh, with the support of the banking system. I'm sure Mr. Rengenadhan will uh, explain further. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, so essentially, I mean, this was uh, initially done to stabilize the market, uh, particularly uh, because there was uh, speculation building up about uh, all sorts of things, including Sri Lanka's ability to repay uh, its maturing debt. Now, the largest amount of debt maturing in 2021 uh, has been repaid. More than 70% uh, uh, of this year's debt uh, repayments have been done. And uh, in the next uh, few months, we will mostly be accumulating uh, reserves rather than uh, spending uh, them. And official reserves uh, were at uh, 4 billion US dollars at the end of, uh, 2000, uh, at the end of uh, July. Sorry, at the end of June 2021, this has declined to 2.8 billion uh, US dollars. But this does not include the three year bilateral currency swap facility with the People's Bank of China, amounting to 1.5 billion US dollars. And I say, say, as I said uh, before, uh, from now on, we are uh, looking, at the, the re looking at reserve accumulation. And thus far during the year, the central bank has purchased more than 250 million from the forex market uh, on a gross basis. And we have spent uh, some money out of that uh, at the beginning of the year to stabilize the exchange rate. Uh, so overall, uh, central bank net purchases of forex from the market uh, have been about 170 million US dollars. Um, so the 1 billion uh, sovereign bond uh, uh, that matured at the end of uh, 2000, uh, uh, end of July uh, 2021, that was repaid, although there was a, quite a bit of noise about uh, our ability to uh, uh, service this debt. And, uh, and also, I mean, going forward, uh, Sri Lanka is, um, I, if I can explain the, the plan, uh, we are expecting several flows in several inflows in the period ahead. The IMF SDR allocation of US dollars 780 million. This is uh, not a not a loan, uh, and uh, it's uh, something that uh, Sri Lanka gets because of its membership of the IMF. So it's not a loan. You can consider it as a grant. We don't have to repay. It. And uh, from the China Development Bank, we are expecting $300 million. Uh, million. And uh, there are two swaps with the Reserve Bank of India and Bangladesh Bank, totaling to about 600 uh, to 650 million US dollars. And uh, we are collecting uh, uh, around $50 million a month through uh, purchases of exports, uh, export proceeds and remittances. And we are expecting rollovers of uh, domestic swaps and new domestic swaps. Um, and the government is planning uh, divestment of non-strategic, uh, underutilized state-owned uh, assets. And uh, the government is expecting increased inflows uh, of project loans and also a syndicated loan facility to the government. And uh, to the government and the central bank, uh, there are several discussions ongoing on uh, uh, attracting inflows from uh, friendly nations and central banks. And these are all in addition to the expected inflows from the private corporate uh, sector. So um, the, if I explain the strategy, essentially, in the short term, I think we need uh, uh, this kind of uh, short term inflows. But the long-term uh, plan that the, the country has to uh, follow is clear. Uh, it is essential for the country to enhance non-debt creating inflows. So we have depended on uh, debt for a, quite a long period of time. And now it is time for us to improve on non-debt non uh, sources of inflows. And the government is actually uh, working on this very uh, vigorously and uh, focus is on merchandise exports, services exports, workers remittances and foreign investment. And uh, there are several uh, institutions, organizations 
task forces working on this to ensure that the, the bottlenecks that are faced by those sectors are uh, addressed, <laughs> are addressed very quickly. And the, the, the expectations are realized without uh, much of a disturbance. So obviously, I mean, there will be disturbances and we are probably aiming uh, too high uh, in relation to non debt creating inflows. But this process is going on. And uh, we, uh, we also believe that uh, this is something uh, necessary. Uh, this is a necessary transformation that should happen in the Sri Lankan economy. And also in this process, the ease of doing business will also gradually uh, improve uh, with uh, concerted efforts to uh, support uh, these uh, sectors. So uh, this is my last slide. Uh, the, the story will not be complete without uh, mentioning the Colombo Port City and the much uh, awaited uh, Colombo Port City Commission Act has been uh, passed. And uh, this is supposed to be the supposed to be Sri Lanka's single largest foreign direct investment project. And uh, the, I uh, was made to understand the necessary directions and regulations are being put in place. And uh, the port city, um, the, the investment promotion is going on at the moment. And uh, once uh, in place, this will create a world-class city with office, retail, residential, hospitality and recreation facilities. Uh, which will also provide uh, a substantial amount of uh, employment opportunities for Sri Lankans uh, and expatriate Sri Lankans as well as uh, foreigners within the port city area. Uh, and uh, this is in addition to the industrial zones that are being planned and that are, uh, are we, we have already seen some investments coming into those. And uh, we... Uh, uh, firmly believe that this is uh, definitely the way forward rather than uh, depending on a debt-driven uh, uh, development uh, strategy. So with that, uh, let me stop and uh, uh, I'll be happy to take up your questions uh, if you have any. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... Dr. Chandna Tamarasekar, I think you gave a detailed description of the, uh, uh, the uh, balance of payments, the trade surplus, and uh, all areas relating to the uh, banking and the economic uh, sector. I think you mentioned uh, one important, uh, 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 maybe a phrase that you mentioned, that is uh, uh, non-debt non creating inflows. I think... Uh, that's, I think, most of those uh, who are present here are really people who want to uh, take the country in uh, that direction. And of course, uh, that we should not go for that uh, non-driven, uh, maybe the strategy should be that. Uh, I just want to maybe give you one example because uh, um, uh, where this had happened, you know, it's uh, maybe in the 90s, uh, when this happened, where, where actually the trade took... Uh, maybe uh, a better place than uh, loans, you know. Uh, this was the time that we launched the garment factory program, the 200 garment factory program, and it was based on the US quota. So that's why it is very, very essential that we have these uh, uh, trade channels open in order that the exports could be developed. So one is, uh, with that, the, uh, all the, the private sector got attracted and uh, the export quota is a marketing element that we really need. So I think uh, we need to get countries to give us that uh, maybe the uh, special facility, maybe the GSP facility and the reduction that so that all our exports uh, can go, but uh, not on the loan uh, facility. Then in the other second thing was we took all these to the rural area. I think that is the area where which really saved the industry because if you had it in Colombo, uh, we would have not been able to survive all these things. But as a result of the spread, uh, this should be done. And the other important thing is for these people uh, who went outside uh, the, uh, to the rural areas, we gave them tax incentives. I think this is something that our private, private sector really understands because if you give that, uh, definitely they will become very active. So I just told something of the past uh, where I really had the experience. So uh, what I will now do is I'll first get the... Uh, banking side, because as I said, we have the expert uh, 
uh, Mr. Ringanathan, MD of the uh, Commercial Bank. So, Mr. Ringanathan, can I invite you to uh, uh, say uh, maybe uh, your uh, experiences and what you think, uh, how our economy should be uh, going forward? Also, first of all, let me thank you for me, but uh, Dr. Chandranath has uh, really clearly explained the challenges that the country is going through at the moment, as well as the opportunities that the country has. So I think I'll take it from there. Uh, as far as the SME sector is concerned, also, I think uh, with my banking experience, if you look at uh, about 15 to 20 years ago, mostly the SMEs were, when they came to the banks, we were definitely asking for the first first question was what is the security that you are going to give to us that was the situation at that time so smes found it very difficult to get the funding but today things have changed and most of the banks are prepared to look at sme uh, requests for funding uh, uh, for sme entrepreneurs uh, even with or without the collateral cover so that is in regard to the you know banking sector which has changed attitude and mostly all the banks are focusing on uh, SME entrepreneurship and uh, you know growing their lending portfolios with more of a SME sector lending. So while that uh, focus of the banks are there, if you if I may share my own bank's experience also, we have been taking various initiatives to grow our SME portfolio. We have a separate dedicated division and various other initiatives. I don't want to go into all that. But since of recently, we have come up even with uh, uh, a separate, uh, you know, networking arrangement for the SME, successful SME entrepreneurship, which we call it as BIS Club, uh, where we invite the successful SME entrepreneurs to join this particular uh, networking, uh, you know, uh, section where they are recognized for their past satisfactory performance and also to continuously have a follow-up of their progress. So this is, in effect, if I may put it very short, it's like the corporates who enjoy the relationship management uh, concept. The, we have now introduced a similar relationship management concept for the SMEs. So just touching on that, why I did this was because the banks are today focused towards SMEs uh, you know, sector and growing SME entrepreneurship. On the other side, if you take the economic challenges, I think the country as Dr. mentioned, is actually going through a bit of a difficult or much more challenging period. We had two, uh, more than two, uh, two and a half years, we have been facing various different types of challenges, starting with the Easter Sunday in 2019, then came last March, we had this COVID uh, pandemic affecting the globally, plus including our country. Initially, we were able to manage it, but with the third wave of the COVID, again, we are faced with much more challenging period. So with all these challenges coming in, so definitely the country's economic development also gets affected and we have challenges in that. One of the major challenge that the economy is going through and we as bankers are also going through is in regard to the foreign currency shortage position. Uh, so I thought I will touch on that, but everyone need to understand this is not in regard to liquidity, but this is in regard to foreign currency position. So how the banks, I thought I'll share this to this forum, how the banks, uh, you know, meet the import expenditure. Banks actually buy dollars from the exporters and the uh, wage remitters. And uh, of course, with other remittances coming in for either investment purposes or from the tourism, et cetera. So we buy dollars from those who bring in dollars into this market from exports, remittances, and tourism, and other foreign direct investments. And then we use that buying dollar position to meet the imports cost. So therefore, when we don't have enough sufficient dollars getting converted to rupees, this is what we need to understand. Today, the country with all these challenges, global challenges, is in a position to manage the exports. Please, we have the exports levels are at least almost the same. So in addition to that, remittance is also the country's in a position to manage that inflows coming from remittances at almost the same level. But where we have got really badly affected is the tourism earnings. Tourism earnings from 2019 has dropped totally. 
and uh, which is normally about four to five billion. So that is actually causing a bigger challenge to the foreign currency uh, position. And also some of these exports not getting converted also has it really added uh, the challenging situation. So therefore, since the conversion of the dollars that are purchased uh, is less, the, we as bankers are having a problem in assisting our import customers uh, for them to meet their import payments. So, and when I say import payments, it is not only import payments, any outward uh, payments, including for various uh, other expenditures like uh, university payments uh, and various other payments also, we have a challenging situation. But these are all temporary situation, like doctor presented uh, in his uh, slide presentation, the country is expecting a certain amount of additional inflows to come in. Country is also working towards a certain amount of revival of the tourism as early as possible. So what we need to understand is there is always an opportunity even in this challenging time. My humble request to the entrepreneurs is actually don't take the macro level challenges as major issue when it comes to SMEs. You all are in a better position when you look at your business side separately and see how best that you can manage. Of course, there is a certain amount of impact from the macro to the micro level of the SME entrepreneurs also. I know some of you all, if you all are involved in the trading side, definitely there'll be a certain amount of impact, which you need to manage it with different ways of uh, uh, you know, looking at your own question separately and you have to manage it. So I, uh, I will pause it at this stage and uh, take up some questions specifically, but uh, it's a challenging period, but we all need to have confidence. It need not be looked at as a long-term challenging position. As Dr. mentioned, there are various plans the government has and uh, various authorities are working on. If you look at the banks, we are also working on raising funds from overseas and bringing it here. Right now, I'm, I'm happy to say that we have also got some uh, amount of funds coming from uh, uh, so from another de developer financial institution uh, from a different country. Uh, for the first time in the history of Sri Lanka, we have managed to get that borrowing, which will be announced very soon. So these monies, it's about $50 million. These monies, when it comes into the country, it gets converted to rupees, then it will give us some sort of a comfort for us to meet the import payments. So with that, I'll pause it, uh, Professor, and uh, yeah. take up the questions later. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ingrad. I think uh, you really gave the private sector banking uh, overview. So, uh, Dr. Anda, do you have any comments on that? Not really. I completely agree with what um, Mr. Ingradan said. And uh, if I may touch upon uh, just one point uh, that uh, uh, I would like to elaborate on. Uh, so essentially, uh, the, the, the behavior of exchange rate and the liquidity, forex liquidity in the market. So as Mr. Rengarathan said, on the one hand, uh, the, the, it is speculation uh, to uh, which to a great extent is driving uh, this uh, pressure on liquidity at the moment. Uh, but uh, but we, have, we, we are seeing this subsiding gradually, uh, which, is a, uh, which is an encouraging development. Uh, on the one hand, the ex foreign exchange earnings, uh, I would say, were not willing to uh, convert, expecting the rupee to depreciate further. And on the other hand, import importers were uh, sort of front loading uh, the import uh, bills. I mean, they were they were trying to import as much as possible before uh, the exchange rate depreciates. So uh, I think. Uh, that is uh, changing now. And uh, the, I think the expectation in the market was that the, the rupee will depreciate sharply with the repayment of this, uh, uh, by the time of the repayment of this sub bond. But now that it's over, I think we can um, gradually revert to uh, the uh, a normal position in the forex uh, market. Uh, and as Mr. Ranganathan said, the, the government, the central bank, the banking system and the corporate sector, uh, we are all working uh, towards attracting uh, foreign exchange inflows to the country, which will ease uh, the pressure. And I think uh, there is a limit to, uh, 
to uh, which the, the speculation could also drive the market. And uh, we have probably seen uh, the end to uh, that, uh, that uh, type of uh, speculation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tandat. Now, for the industry point of view, uh, can I uh, uh, invite Dr. Kulatunga Rajapaksa, the uh, Emeritus Managing Director of the BSI Group, to uh, give his view? Thank you, Professor. Now, Dr. Mr. Ringanathan has uh, sort of answered the question I was about to ask about the opening of LCs for the companies who have uh, who do not have much exports, rather, because uh, we are in, in a difficult position to get down raw materials and machinery stored layout because uh, uh, because of the situation. Uh, only thing, if it is temporary, we can afford to uh, keep it. But only thing is, uh, we don't know the uh, as to when we can uh, get this cleared because the prices offered by our suppliers are not uh, they, they, they changing almost daily due to variation of uh, freight rates. So uh, this is a real situation to almost all the industries because even getting the raw materials and LCs of higher values are delayed very badly because of the situation. So I don't know whether there's any uh, if there's any can if we can uh, get a time frame or indication as to when we can get all the situation, it will be very helpful to the industries. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rajapaksa, Mr. Ringanathan, and Dr. Chandranath. I think you can. Uh, there may be areas you can clarify. I think Mr. Ranganathan should. Okay. <laughs> okay. As I mentioned, uh, Dr. Rajavaksa, I, I need to uh, read what I mentioned earlier. We, it all depends on how the inflows get converted in the market. So as, uh, as early as possible, as Dr. Chan has also mentioned that, you know, some, uh, you, know, you know, expectations of the rupee being depreciated is one of the reasons why these uh, conversions are not taking place at the level at which it should have taken place. So, I think the rupee will further depreciate or depreciate sharply and they are holding on. And in some cases, uh, of course, uh, the inflows are not getting converted for some other reasons. Therefore. So, I think the more the inflows gets converted, we will have the big, the one of the important thing which I need to mention. Why did I say that it's a short term? Let me explain this. My view is it's a short term. Why I said is because these monies we have seen coming into this country, the exports have not dropped. Doctor has shown that the one billion or whatever the amount of levels of exports we have, we are having it. We are having the thank God. I know we thought in last year the remittances will get affected, <clears throat> but we are having the remittances flow. Thank God coming in. To this country at the similar level at which slight decrease maybe but it is coming so both these except for the tourism yes there is a other two are coming in. if these two gets converted of course wage remittances are getting converted but the export side if it's get converted and uh, if we can revive the tourism as fast as possible and get back to that tourism momentum also bring in earnings into this country getting converted plus certain amount of uh, you know, borrowings that we, most of the banking systems have, you know, really initiated. If those monies also come in, like Dr. Bencher showed some of these, you know, IMF, uh, SDR, and other inflows, which I expected also comes in. Uh, I, we will be able to, you know, come out of this problem. So since these are all lined up, these are all actually, some of them have already come, not got converted. Uh, I, 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 strongly feel this will be a temporary issue and very soon we should be able to come out of this. But if in case, unfortunately, I must mention even to these participants here, if each one of us don't contribute to manage and arrest this particular COVID pandemic impact and the you know, spread, we will all have more time to come back to normal. We all need to be mindful and do whatever possible ways without expecting someone else to, you know, solve the spread of this COVID. We all, if we can very carefully manage ourselves and contain this spread, I think the government initiatives to revive the tourism or open up the airports, et cetera, will definitely uh, bring in that uh, solution as fast as possible. Thank you, Mr. Ngan. Dr. Uh, Dr. Tandat, you need, have any comments to me? 
Yeah, just a little bit to add to what uh, Mr. Langlander said. Uh, so um, we uh, understand the issues faced by uh, some of the uh, industrialists and uh, we appreciate the work that is uh, being done by uh, Dr. Rajapaksha and uh, uh, his associated company uh, and the others. Uh, but uh, as Mr. Rengadadhan said, uh, if we don't work together, uh, we'll be in more trouble uh, than uh, what we used to see uh, in the recent past. Because uh, uh, if you look at the, the numbers uh, of uh, imports and exports, it doesn't uh, really justify the claim that uh, the importers are uh, facing uh, issues. I mean, uh, the, I have the, the first half uh, 2021 import numbers with me. It has exceeded 10 billion US dollars, whereas in 2021, total imports were uh, 16 billion. So in the first half itself, 10 billion US dollars of imports. A part of that, of course, is uh, the increased uh, oil bill, which is uh, in the first half, which is not much. It's just 500 million increase. But uh, this 10 billion uh, import bill is without any motor vehicles coming to the country. So we are actually looking at a very large import bill, which includes a substantial amount of intermediate goods uh, imports, as well as consumer goods imports, and also investment goods imports. So uh, it is uh, the some industrialists who really need Forex are probably facing uh, that situation because as a country, we are importing more and more which is what we are trying to uh, change, which is what the government is also trying to change. And we know that it is an essential change that we have to uh, face. So in that regard, uh, um, again, I would urge the domestic industri industrialists to focus on sourcing whatever raw material possible from uh, the country uh, itself and uh, change the orientation of their uh, the production uh, processes as well to uh, as much as possible thank you thank, thank you dr Tandat. i think uh, the problems that we are currently facing is really on the foreign exchange so we have the chairman of the export development board or the edb uh, mr suresh dimel so i'm sure he is someone who might be able to provide some comfort to all of us so uh, mr suresh uh, dimel can i invite you to maybe uh, the, give the strategies and the uh, sort of uh, way that you are going to assist all these uh, people who are having problems on foreign exchange. Suresh, are you there? Okay. I think he may be having some problems. So what we will do is in the meantime, uh, there are a few questions that have come up, uh, which I will read. Uh, is the positive movement of the indices of CSE on account of fear that rupee will depreciate shortly? That is uh, the stock market going up, whether it has any uh, connection to the rupee depreciation. If I may respond, Professor, I uh, I don't think so. So uh, essentially, I mean, the stock market uh, is an alternative investment opportunity. So when uh, a bank deposit rates uh, are low, people tend to invest in uh, the stock market and uh, the real estate market and so on. So uh, I do not think that uh, the depreciation uh, is... Uh, the, the expectation of depreciation is one reason for uh, the, 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 what is happening in the stock market. It is probably driven more by uh, the lower interest rates and uh, uh, people going after uh, you know, a higher uh, earnings, potential earnings uh, through the, the stock market and uh, the, the real estate market. We saw uh, a recent uh, 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 document released by the, the central bank also about land value, uh, land values uh, starting to go up uh, again. And uh, that also uh, is probably related to what, uh, what is being asked. Thank you. 
Mr. Rengaraja, you have any uh, views or comments on that? Uh, no, professor, I fully agree with him because actually that uh, stock market uh, is not related to the rupee depreciation. It is because of the interest rate uh, issue. I think Dr. Changnath uh, very clearly explained that. I am fully in agreement with what he said. Right. Thank you. The next question. Uh, is the government practice of refusing price increases, example, gas, milk, foods, etc., despite of actual costs going beyond the allowed pricing, a desirable practice? Dr. Tandra, do you like to take that? I don't think I have to uh, respond to that, Professor, because uh, I think common sense will... Uh, Will, uh, I think all of us have common sense and we all know the, the, uh, the answer to that. I don't think we, are, we need a specific response to that. I think what they are saying is that uh, without, if the price is not increased, then the supply situation can have a problem. I think that's what uh, they are really trying to say. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, so obviously the government uh, will have its own... Uh, uh, reasons. One is yeah. uh, that uh, the cost of living on the one hand could get affected and the other one is that uh, the uh, we, we have seen price price fluctuations. I mean right right now we see uh, uh, gas prices increasing in the global market again but there were several uh, periods of low gas prices. Uh, so at that time uh, I, I don't think the benefit of the low gas prices were uh, transmitted to uh, uh, the customers. So, uh, so the, the, there are reasons, but uh, um, yeah, personally, I'm a believer of uh, market prices. Mr. Ingraj, and actually, uh, maybe just a few comments on that matter, because now supposing if a customer comes to your bank and then you know that he has to sell it at a loss, uh, do you think that would be uh, something that you all will undertake or open LCs? Definitely as a lender, I will not encourage, neither as a bank also, I will not encourage uh, someone to lose and run or operate their business. But if there are reasons for that, of they have the control, but I think this question is on the government side. So if that is happening and if, you are, if, the, if one of my customers is involved in that, yes, definitely, I cannot also agree that they should continue to lose and run the business. Thank you, Mr. Ingranathan. Then, uh, yeah, uh, Mr. Hasita Pereira, any suggestions from CBSL to stabilize US dollar and impact of import costs hugely affect most of businesses? CBSL to stabilize US dollar, that is, I suppose, the appreciation and the impact of the import costs hugely, uh, which will affect most businesses. Um, so, as Mr. Ingranathan also, uh, uh, highlighted earlier, I think the, it is a problem. The issue is with uh, market liquidity. So uh, the central bank does not print uh, US dollars. We can print uh, rupees, but not dollars. So unless there are forex inflows coming in, uh, we cannot uh, support uh, outflows. Uh, the uh, as as as. Uh, you know, I mean, we can we can have policies uh, which could uh, promote inflows and uh, reduce outflows, but uh, the um, you have seen the level of reserves, and we uh, uh, usually what we do is we intervene in the forex market to stabilize the exchange rate uh, through uh, selling uh, forex or if we want to uh, by by purchasing forex, but. Uh, uh, I don't think that we want to do that uh, right now. Uh, so essentially, it is up to the country to bring in uh, forex and convert them into uh, rupees, so that the foreign exchange spenders can use that uh, for uh, to facilitate imports and other other uh, foreign exchange related uh, imports. So it's a market. Uh, 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 basically, I mean, the market uh, supply and demand forces uh, should work, uh, and uh, the central bank's role in uh, stabilizing the market, uh, particularly in the forex, is uh, 
quite uh, limited. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is uh, from Risley Mueller. Has there been any dollar inflows on incentive of 1% tax on income held abroad? That has been this recent incentive that was given. Has there been any dollar inflows on incentive of 1% tax on income held abroad? I don't think this is in place yet, right? Yeah. So, uh, this has to go through the, the parliamentary approval process. Yeah, right. Okay, there is another question. Yeah, this is from uh, Mr. Venkat Pramini from India. Uh, Sri Lanka has huge potential for attracting international tourists and the same has to be exploited for earning foreign exchange. Sun and sea is the biggest attraction for Europe and USA. Religious tourism is another area. Hindus in India will be attracted to Kadirkamam, Trinkamali and places related to Ramayana. Norelia will hill station also be a big attraction. I request you to explore all the above. It will create large employment opportunities for local youth. I think there is a comment, very, very useful comment from Mr. Venkat Ramani. Uh, yeah, any uh, comments uh, anyone wants to make on that? Or shall we? Okay, the next one is uh, from uh, Mr. Hathiraga Kumar. Why foreign reserves did not plan before the COVID? Is it central bank have no any plan and policy to handle such a situation? I think what he is saying is why we did not build our foreign reserves earlier before the COVID. I think that's something that he is asking. I don't know whether uh, uh, Dr. Tandar would like to answer that. Um, so uh, what happened in Sri Lanka, I'm not sure whether uh, uh, the gentleman who's asking the question is Sri Lankan or not. Uh, in uh, 2019, we faced uh, another crisis, as uh, you may remember, the Easter Sunday attacks. And uh, in uh, 2018, Sri Lanka earned about uh, four and a half billion US dollars through uh, tourism. But with the Easter Sunday attacks, tourism uh, came to a standstill uh, overnight. Uh, by the end of April and the beginning of May. And uh, there was a rapid recovery of tourism, but we lost about one and a half billion US dollars from tourism in uh, 2019 itself. And uh, then came COVID. Uh, so we were not uh, in a very strong position when, uh, when uh, COVID hit the economy. And also, if you look at the growth performance, uh, the the Sri Lanka's growth rate gradually decelerated uh, over a few uh, few years. Uh, from uh, yeah, if you look at uh, in in 2019, growth was just 2.3 percent. So uh, we were not on a very uh, good wicket when uh, the the year 2020 began, uh, and uh, there were uh, the, so the 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 key uh, requirement was to revive the economy. And that's why there were uh, tax cuts and that's why there were reductions in uh, interest rates and pumping of liquidity and so on. Uh, so on top of that, uh, I think we are all aware of the debt service challenges that the, the country uh, was facing and the country will be facing in the period ahead. So uh, reserves of the central bank uh, are being used to meet all those multiple challenges and uh, because, I mean, that's why uh, a country has uh, reserves. Uh, it's not uh, just to accumulate reserves and boast that we have this much of reserves. So during uh, bad times, you utilize the reserves. And during good times or better times, you uh, build uh, up reserves. And that's uh, those are the cycles that we have uh, gone through in the past. Uh, but uh, again, I should emphasize that uh, going forward, the rather than borrowing and building uh, reserves, we should uh, strengthen our export sector or in exchange earning sectors so that we have uh, uh, a higher amount of non-debt related uh, reserves that we can uh, utilize uh, during bad times. Thank you. There's another question. Can banks use uh, SDA inflows? 
which the banks can use SDA includes. There is a question. I will answer that, uh, Professor. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yes. Uh, yes. SDA is a special deposit account. Banks do not use customers' deposit accounts for meeting these type of import payments or outward payments. Uh, these deposits are held in an asset, either in the form of cash or in some bonds or for lending purposes. So banks do not convert the deposits and meet the import payments. I hope uh, that answer clarifies the question. Uh, banks keep the customer's deposits in some asset form in that currency itself, if possible. If not, it will be converted to the US dollar currency, which is the major currency. We keep it. We don't change or convert that foreign currency into rupees and again reconvert the rupees into that foreign currency. We keep it in dollar terms itself. And in dollar terms itself, we invest either in, in the form of a lending or in the form of some sort of a instrument where we can earn income. Thank you, Mr. Ringanathan. The next question from JC Deshanta Dialvis. When do you think the construction work in the Colombo port city will start? And how much FDIs do you expect to come through that to the country in this year? I think that was mentioned. Uh, Dr. Tandat, you like to mention? From what we hear from the port city company as well as the, uh, the commission is that uh, construction work will begin uh, this year itself. And uh, the, we have, we know, uh, um, I'm not sure whether you are aware of the, the investment, joint investment that is, uh, that has uh, uh, been taking place uh, with uh, the Browns Group uh, and the, 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 the Port City Company. Uh, so uh, uh, pretty soon the construction will begin. And uh, we also hear that the, the, the what they call the, the basically I mean some parts of that uh, parts of uh, the port city will be will also be opened up for the the public uh, particularly the beach uh, area uh, but uh, about FDIs I think it's more tricky uh, what we hear from uh, the port city companies that there is uh, quite a bit of interest from local companies as well as uh, foreign companies, but uh, the, uh, they are expecting the, the initial inflows to come from uh, the local companies rather than foreign companies, but uh, only uh, then uh, the foreign counterparties also to join. So hopefully uh, towards the very end of this year and the beginning of next year, there will be uh, the foreign direct investments coming uh, as investment into Port City. I mean, this is in addition to the FDIs uh, that are coming to the Port City company itself. I will stop there. Thank you, Dr. Anja. There's another question. It's on the exchange rate. Is it not more prudent to allow the exchange rate to find their own levels rather than artificial capping of rates? The fear is that given uncertainty, no one knows when this problem will resolve. On this one, I think uh, there will be uh, diverse views, I mean, depending on uh, which side you are in, uh, whether you are a foreign exchange earner or, you know, I mean, so many sides. I mean, it's not just two sides. Uh, so uh, the, when you uh, look at the, the, uh, the what, what, something I have to say is that uh, since 2001, the Rupee is supposed to be free floating. There have been uh, different types of interventions from time to time, uh, the, the selling or buying forex from the market and also uh, what is called moral suasion, discussions with banks. Uh, but uh, overall, it has, uh, it has been free floating. There have been episodes of appreciation, episodes of depreciation, uh, more episodes of depreciation than appreciation. Uh, so, uh, and uh, we have seen how those uh, movements have impacted the economy in various ways. So uh, if I give you an example, uh, we have a very large amount of foreign currency denominated debt. And whenever the rupee depreciates, the value of the rupee value of that goes up, which has several macroeconomic uh, implications. Uh, 
but uh, at the same time, we have to consider whether the, the depreciation, whether depreciation could uh, help uh, exporters and uh, would boost uh, exports and whether depreciation would uh, reduce uh, imports. But uh, that kind of elasticities do not seem to uh, be uh, working very well in Sri Lanka due to the, the inelastic uh, type of exports as well as imports that we uh, have in our baskets. Uh, I wonder whether Mr. Ranganathan has anything to add. Doctor, I think uh, <clears throat> what you said is perfect because uh, that's a real position because by allowing, uh, as you said, you know, we, have, we are a country, we have the free float. You know, but what happens is, uh, what happened in the recent past is actually there was certain unnecessary panic which created a, a situation where the forward rates were quoted at very high, deep, deep discounted rates or deep depreciated uh, local currency rates. So which is one of the reasons that the central bank rightly came up with the controls on forward markets. Thereafter, even with that, there were import controls and then certain measures were taken to manage this particular rate to a certain level. Otherwise, if that proper free float was allowed, the, because of the panic, the market would have really uh, you know, shown highly depreciated local currency. And that has impact to the overall macroeconomy as Dr. Uh, clearly mentioned, because we are a country which we have, which have substantial foreign borrowing, so that will impact us. So to a certain extent, this control is also needed, but the control, as I said, the control is not going to be there for a long period of time. I don't think uh, we will do that. A uh, certain amount of control is required at this moment of time to manage these uh, turbulent times. Thank you, Mr. Ganathan. There is another question from Ms. Nadira Atukurali. We have been seeing the decline of ratings for some time. If the rating is not improved, we'd, be, uh, we'd see as a failure and no party will trust us in future. So what are the actions planned by CBSL to improve the rating of Sri Lanka? Thank you very much. And uh, yes, ratings are important. Uh, and also you must understand those are sovereign ratings so uh, although the central bank is a facilitator uh, we are talking about the rating of the the, the government the sovereign uh, and uh, obviously it is disappointing to see the continued uh, you know rating downgrades and uh, some of those we have uh, uh, some of those downgrades and uh, commentaries that we have seen are uh, quite disappointing. Just uh, so, I mean, uh, uh, Moody's uh, this time, uh, just before the repayment of the sovereign bond of 1 billion, put us on a rating watch uh, for downgrade with a view to downgrade. And that's exactly what uh, was done last year also. So, whenever uh, there is uh, such a watch uh, with a view to downgrade, then the market uh, reacts uh, and, uh, and uh, the sovereign bond yields in the secondary market, they react. Uh, and whenever there is an actual downgrade also, uh, they react. So it's a double whammy actually. So, uh, and there are three rating agencies, uh, Moody's, S&P, Fitch. Uh, they don't take uh, rating action at the same time. They have different uh, intervals and uh, that has also hurt us in the, in the past. So obviously, I mean, uh, there are two uh, key uh, aspects that the rating agencies uh, look at. One is uh, the, the fiscal side, the budget deficits uh, and the debt levels. And the other one is the reserve side, the strength of uh, reserves. So uh, we know that both have to be improved at the same time. There is a role, uh, a key role must be pay played by the government. Uh, and uh, of course, we can also facilitate uh, the improvements. Um, and uh, I think uh, on ratings, we know that the, the banking institutions uh, are also uh, quite concerned because uh, as correctly said in the, in the question itself, 
uh, the sovereign ratings. Although, I mean, we, there is no plan to go to the uh, sovereign bond market at the moment. This uh, this could affect our future. Uh, this could affect the future borrowing of the financial sector and uh, corporates as well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Engranen. Any uh, impact on the commercial banks uh, as a result of these ratings? I meant to say, frankly, Professor, uh, uh, these rating agencies also had panicked, and you know they have come up with these type of downgrades. In my view, see, last uh, last year October also, uh, they rushed before the bonds were uh, repaid. And the downgrade took place again this year. Now today, the bonds have been repaid. Of course, these foreign currency reserves also, this country has had nearly about a billion or one and a half billion levels of foreign currencies in the past also. At that time, of course, imports would have been less, but still we have gone through these up and downs. Even in my banking area, I have seen this in this country. So it's not a major issue that the country is facing, but unfortunately, sometimes rating agencies, they, they have certain models on which they work and they come up with these things. But uh, my answer to this, so last one and a half years, we have been facing this type of downgrade. With all that, you would have seen in the markets, some of our banks have raised foreign currency loans from overseas. We, our bank, we managed to get foreign currency equity into this uh, from uh, OZ's DFIs invested into our bank uh, equity. Plus, now, we, uh, as I said, you know, very soon you'll be knowing that uh, we are also borrowing, uh, you know, substantial amounts from foreign currency markets in spite of uh, such downgrade uh, of the country's sovereign rating. Thank you, Mr. Inga. I think that was a very, very important point that you raised where you all have been able to raise foreign loans. And also now you're planning to get something into future. So I, I'm sure uh, you all are really tackling the problem in the correct manner and that uh, the bankers are really able to withstand any problem that is there and take the country forward. So I'm sure that you all will be able to solve most of these problems uh, that we are having. I think the last question uh, that is really on the SME, that is there any plan to grant further moratorium to SMEs on borrowing? So I don't know whether uh, there is anything... Uh, the, so my answer, answer. <laughs> I will so answer from our side, but Mr. Ringanandan <laughs> might, uh, <laughs> might, uh, might be planning for a moratorium uh, to no, SME. No, no, no. We have been giving moratoriums on many occasions in the past, doctor. So we didn't want to call it as moratorium, but we have been restructuring the advances given to our borrowers on many mm -hmm. occasions in the past. But since it became a national issue, the central bank and the government came in with the proper uh, plans and the systems to provide this relief to the affected borrowers. That is how this moratorium word has come into the market. Now everyone comes up with the moratorium stand, the moratorium stand. So the issue here is actually what is important is we as a bank, we are keen that our the money that we lend from our shareholders plus our depositors' money that we lend, we want to get it back. We want to require it back. We expect our customers borrow from us and you know, engage in some business activities and make generate more funds to repay us plus make profits out of it. Therefore, we are keen to recover the money. At the same time, we want to see that the customer is doing well. So on that basis, if the customer is getting affected due to operating environment challenges, we are prepared to listen to them and look at the individual cases and give them some additional time to repay that. So the moratorium should not be taken as something time that we have a problem, run to the bank and ask for moratorium or push the central bank and ask the government to come up with moratoriums. I think we should now forget these moratoriums and uh, talk to us, talk to the bankers, what exact problem that you all are having and, and discuss with us. Show us the real plans to revive your business. We are happy to, more than happy to give you whatever restructuring moratorium or reshuffleman, whatever the words that you say, but it's a matter of rearranging the repayment program. We'll be happy to do that. Thank you very much, Mr. Engan. I'm sure uh, more of your customers will be coming to you shortly. So, uh, uh, Mr. Suresh uh, Dimel, are you there? Okay, I think uh, on the... Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, Suresh. Sorry, I, no, no, I, we were I, really... Uh, yeah, yeah. 
we were trying to see as to how from the export industry because we are having a shortage of foreign exchange what are the actions that you are doing to increase the export so that we will get more foreign exchange into the country professor the the, the low hanging fruit that i see is fruits and vegetables where 50 to 60% of fruits and vegetables are going to waste in this country without post harvest proper post harvest handling and i think we can quickly make use of that harvest and earn some foreign exchange so i mean because i am also in the in agricultural industry i i feel that that is uh, an opportunity that we need to grab and i think your voice is uh, not there Suresh, you lost your voice. Right. Uh, I think uh, our time is. Uh, we have gone here more than our time. If uh, Mr. Suresh comes back, he can speak. Uh, Dr. Kulatunga, you have any uh, maybe uh, final comments to make before we? No, no. It's a it's a very good uh, very good uh, presentation, and it's an eye opener for most of the importers because all the industries are clamoring about this. Difficulty in opening of LCs has that been clarified? Only thing is, you know, uh, still we don't have any date ultimatum as to when this can be released. But we have to hope for the best. That's all that we can think of right now. This difficulty they have all the industry list. Right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kulatunga. Uh, can I now invite uh, Mr. Hennaika Bandar? He himself is a former banker, uh, so that he can give the final. Uh, words and vote of thanks to our uh, two uh, eminent uh, speakers. One is of course Dr. Kandranath, who has really uh, made the presentation, and of course uh, uh, Mr. Ranganathan, who is uh, really being uh, backing most of the matters that we have been trying to ask, and is really doing a very very major task, especially in the foreign exchange area. Mr. Ranganathan, go to you. Professor, thank you, Professor. And let me take uh, just two minutes to uh, recognize and appreciate the contribution made by all of you. Uh, on behalf of CAPM SME Committee, I am glad to propose this word of thanks after a successful seminar and discussion conducted by Dr. Chandranath Tamarasekar on update on current economic development and challenges. Uh, as mentioned uh, by our president, uh, he is not a stranger to CAPM and. Has supported CMA in the past as well in conducting various programs on the subject area. With that note, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Chandranath for his uh, insightful presentation and taking time off to share his knowledge to educate us on the current economic uh, development. Let me also thank Mr. Ranganathan, a veteran banker who is known to us very well. Uh, for his valuable contribution uh, taken into consideration the current environment as well as the future. I also would like to thank uh, President Bosu Watabel, who is also the chairman of the SME committee of uh, CMA, who organizing this seminar for the benefit of uh, all of you. Finally, I, was, I also would like to thank all our committee members and all of you for your participation. Thank you. Stay safe. Good night. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hennaika. I think uh, let me uh, thank Mr. Hennaika for those uh, final remarks. I think uh, also uh, our chief presenter, Dr. Chandrath, I think it was a very, very, uh, uh, I think it will be useful, plus also explained everything to everyone uh, so that uh, they will know exactly what the position is because it's really not a matter only for the central bank, but also the the, the SME sector, the uh, big industrialists and everyone, because everyone has a role in this. And I think Mr. Ranganathan really uh, uh, explained that and also told as to how the banking sector is really playing a major role. So I think uh, we've had very good uh, 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 presentation and uh, discussion. Then of course, Dr. 
Pulatunga Rajapaksa from the industry side where he was able to give his views and of course on the exports uh, where Mr. Suresh Timel was able to speak. Uh, we had a few more, but un unfortunately because of the time, we could not uh, take it uh, further. But let me thank all of you all once again uh, for this very, very successful uh, conference and uh, seminar uh, that we had. And I'm also uh, thankful and very, very uh, maybe uh, happy to hear the support you all are giving the SME sector because we know that there are a lot of developments to be done. We are really helping in that, in the training and development and the skill development, uh, for which uh, I'm sure that we will get uh, support. Earlier, there was this question from Mr. Venkat Ramani. He's really come up with a very good proposal to set up a trade exchange which they are doing in India uh, for the SME sector. So that we are, uh, they supply the goods and they will be able to take the invoice to the uh, exchange and then uh, discount it and uh, get a very, very favorable rate. So we are now discussing that with him. And certainly we will come to both the central bank and the commercial banks uh, for their support on the matter. And of course, the other matter is the credit guarantee institution where uh, the banks, uh, they are uh, going to invite uh, certain commercial banks and finance companies uh, to be uh, maybe part of uh, that institution, also to take share capital and also to uh, that they will be able to get uh, the collateral that they need from the credit country. So I think a uh, lot of things that are happening, I'm also th uh, you know, very thankful for Central Bank for backing all these things. And uh, I'm sure with their support, uh, we will be able to take the economy forward. And uh, with the uh, expert backing from the private sector, I always feel that uh, private sector, given the due place, will really be able to play the major role, which is the banking sector, the large industry or the SME sector, uh, they will be able to really deliver the goods and take the country forward. So from what we have heard, I'm sure we are uh, going in the right direction. We are planning to build our reserves. And uh, of course, uh, that really requires more exports to come. That's uh, maybe the generation that has to be done. Uh, uh, Mr. Ranganathan will provide the finances. So I think uh, we are all set. Uh, for a big takeoff and let me thank everyone uh, for their participation and uh, wish you uh, all the best and uh, for this participation and uh, good night to everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Good night. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Okay, thanks. Huh? Thanks, Dr. Uh, thanks, uh, Atula. Uh, I really did not have time to give